On behalf of Dallas College and the sustainability team, my name is Faye Davis and I will be your host today. Now to introduce your speaker, Virginia Allen is the 21 year old daughter of David and Mary Ann Allen of Richardson, Texas. She is a freshman at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor studying organizational leadership. She is active in the Collin County Hobby Beekeepers Association and is a leader in her local fire explorers program. She hopes to serve as a paramedic or flight nurse in the future. As the 2021 American Honey Princess, Virginia is a national spokesperson for the American Beekeeping Federation, a trade organization representing beekeepers and honey producers throughout the United States. The Honey Queen and Princess speak and promote in venues nationwide, and Princess Virginia has traveled and spoken extensively nationwide on behalf of the organization. Thank you so much for joining us, Virginia. Take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me here to, to speak at the Dallas College. Um, as Faye just said, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, the different ways that you can help get involved in uh, honeybees. Uh, since that's kind of my job is helping the consumer figure out how they can uh, better assist the beekeeping industry. Um, so to start off with, we're going to go uh, talk a little bit about how I got into beekeeping and kind of what my passion is and how that relates to my current job that I'm doing right now. So to start off with, I was raised in a Christian homeschool, so uh, good, strong morals, but um, with with homeschool, we found ways and different programs to do. Um, that way you could live life and still get school done. And um, it kind of helped blend the two uh, groups, if you will, of schooling and living uh, together. And it makes it a little bit more sustainable. So uh, one of the things that we found to help us with, with uh, homeschooling was actually beekeeping. Um, through our local club, we offered a, or the, the Collin County Hobby Beekeepers Association. Uh, their club's meetings are usually up in McKinney, but they offer a scholarship program where youth can get involved in beekeeping. And through that program, I received my first beehive, I received uh, lessons and also equipment in order to carry me through my first year. But the only thing in request in uh, in return that they asked was that I give two different presentations. One was talking about what kind of uh, things I was seeing inside my hive as the bees were beginning to build their wax, make more bees, and of course just make honey. Uh, but the other presentation was a topical presentation. This was kind of the, the start of my public speaking experience. And of course, that counted towards homeschool as well. So currently, I'm in the Honey Queen program, which is a national association. Well, the, the American Beekeeping Federation is the Nas national association for beekeepers. Um, but the Honey Queen program is basically the community representatives of the federation. So now um, I started in the county level Honey Queen moved up to state honey queen and then now I'm at the American honey queen uh, program. So um, I serve in this year in this role for uh, one year and then I um, I will help kind of mentor the next honey queens as they come up. But basically after this year, I'm planning on going back to college and then getting my bachelor's in organizational leadership. Uh, basically a business management degree, and then that's going to help us to um, just expand our bee company and just be a great degree that I can use in any career field. All right, so as we get into pollination and beescapes, beescapes is basically a word that we use to describe a pollinator garden. So honeybees need a large variety of different flowers in order to be uh, in order to stay nice and healthy. And this kind of what's what you see on your screen with a very flat open field and a little what we call a lollipop tree um, where you can see the, the trunk and then you see the, it kind of the canopy just spread out above. 
uh, that looks very appe uh, appealing, and that's why it's in many parks. But we found that this kind of environment is not very helpful to the bees because there's no vines. Honeybees don't pollinate grass, and while they do pollinate some trees, they uh, cannot pollinate all trees. So this kind of field, while it looks very appealing to us, um, it it doesn't leave the bees with any food in order to live. And honeybees are really important because they help to produce about one third of the food that we eat. Oh. So before we jump in um, a, a little bit more, I'm gonna play this video about um, how pollen and how honeybees kind of play a role into making our food. So, uh, my name is Virginia Allen, and I'm the 2021 American Honey Princess. And today, I'm going to teach you something new about honeybees and pollination. Check out this picture. Do you know what the tiny yellow bits are called? They're called pollen. Pollen is the plant's way of reproducing itself. Surprisingly, there are 380,000 pollen-producing plants worldwide. These plants range from flowering honeysuckle vines to tall cone-bearing pine trees. Pollen that is transferred between plants helps to produce food. Some popular snack foods that are pollinated by honeybees include blueberries, strawberries, oranges, avocados, watermelon, cantaloupe, and cucumbers. So honeybees help produce about one third of the food that we eat. And with that, the USDA estimates that about 80% of insect pollination happens by honeybees. So one third of the food that we eat is pollinated by insects. And the majority of that is by, done by honeybees. So bees are uh, unique in that they have a couple different features uh, that allow them to be very, very efficient pollinators. Some of these include uh, their immense hair that they have throughout their body. They even have hair on their eyeballs. And uh, through static electricity, or using static electricity as they fly through the air, that um, air will move through the hair and that will build up that static charge. And that's going to help that bee to collect pollen when she lands on that flower because all those tiny lightweight pollen bits will jump up onto her and then she'll be completely covered in pollen. Then she can clean herself down and move that pollen onto her back legs and transport it from the flower back to the hive. So that's how honeybees uh, help pollinate is by leaving a little bit of pollen on each uh, flower that they visit. So here's a, uh, an overview of what we're going to cover today. So we're going to see the um, how to plant different gardens, how to use honey, and how that supports our industry, as well as how to connect with bee clubs, because they are a very valuable resource for you as a consumer, or if you're interested in starting bees. So let's do a quick little game time here. So I call this Find the Difference. What's the difference between these two flowers? Any guesses? If you want, you can put your, your comments in, your, in, the, uh, in the chat as we go along. But basically, the difference is how they're seen. It's the exact same picture, just put on through a slightly different filter. So on the uh, left side of the screen, you have what we humans see. We see a nice bright yellow flower. But honeybees see flowers in just a little bit different. They see it in a UV light. So you'll notice it has a little bit more of like a grayscale kind of look, but it does still have colors. Here you can see um, had the difference of the spectrums that honeybees and humans can see. So you can see we can see very well into the red zone um, but then honeybees don't see so much red, but they usually uh, can see darker into like the UV light. So let's look at a couple other um, features of what makes a good honeybee flower. So first off, if it is a, um, if it 
provides pollen and nectar year round, that can be an excellent resource for honeybees. They need a sustainable resource that they can keep going back to in order to, um, in order to live. Honeybees eat pollen and nectar, which then they turn into honey. Um, they eat both the pollen and the honey in order just for themselves to live. The pollen is their protein resource, while the honey is their carbohydrate resource. So they need both of them to live. Just like you would need your meats and your, um, and your veggies, honeybees need both of their uh, foods as well. Another feature would be if the flower is nice, simple, and open. A lot of wildflowers you'll notice have this trait where it's, it looks very simple. It's just, um, you know, the little center and then you have the petals and it's just very simple. It's easy for the bee to see, easy for her to get in there, get the nectar and then get out. If it's an attractive shape, um, like we said, flat, if it's a good color, um, usually red flowers don't attract honeybees. If they are on them, either they smell really, really good, and that attracted the bee to that flower, or possibly there's a dearth or a lack of other flowers in that area that the bee liked, and that's the only thing available. So that's why you might see her on some, um, on some flowers that I might say that they might not go to. But also the, the, the scent of the flower. Honeybees have an, two antenna, which have about 30,000 receptors on each of them. That's a lot, which allows them to smell flowers from a couple miles away. Before they even see the flowers, they locate the, the field um, based on smell. All right, so if that's what makes a good flower, what, what makes a bad flower? or bad flowers for the bees. Um, like I said, if it's the wrong color, like red generally, if it is the wrong shape, if it has tightly packed petals or it's kind of tubular, um, sometimes those kind of tubular flowers, like I think a trumpet vine, um, it might have like a pool of nectar down at the bottom, but uh, while the bee can get in there just fine, the flower doesn't get the benefit of pollination because the bee's not tall enough. Generally, those kind of trumpet vines are more for like hummingbirds or larger bees. And then you also have if it doesn't have any scent. So let's look at a couple different um, examples of what these flowers look like to the bees. So when the honeybee first finds a flower or, or smells a flower, really, then she'll go and fly to the field. But once she gets to the flower, how does she know how to get inside the flower in order to get the nectar. Well, what do you do when you need to go somewhere that you've never been before? Do you ever look it up on a map? Well, the honeybees use their ultraviolet light vision in order to see the map that the flower already has on it. So we call these maps nectar guides. So here you can see that uh, this yellow flower um, looks kind of purple to the bees but it, and notice how it, how it kind of looks like a target with, um, with those stripes going directly to the center there. Here's another yellow flower, but yet a completely different nectar guide system. Uh, this one, again, shows the bee exactly where to go and um, that shows her how to, how to pollinate and gather that sweet treat. So here's a, an example of a purple flower, again, completely different nectar guides, but it's so pretty. I sometimes think it would be interesting to, to see the world in ultraviolet light, but we, are, we do have Google where you can just look up different pictures on there so if you're interested in seeing more uh, flowers under UV light. So here are some different cultivars um, that, um, that kind of show the difference of a wild type of flower versus a more hybrid red flower, um, where the picture on the left, it's the wild poppy flower, and it is a little bit more open. You can easily see the bee, you can see the different parts of the flower, and that's awesome. That's exactly what we wanna see. That's what honeybees want to see, and it's just so easy to get in there and get the nectar and then go on to the next flower. So on the left, in contrast, you can see that this is the same type of flower. It's just been bred to have a lot more petals and very, very tightly packed together. Now, 
can you imagine what kind of nectar guides this type of flower would give? I would imagine it would look like a bunch of tiny little dots. And that's not too helpful when you're trying to get from point A to point B. So this bee, as you can see in the picture, is a little confused. And she might get a little stuck when she's trying to get down into uh, the nectar. So sometimes when this happens, the, the bees still need their resources, right, in order to eat. So what they'll do is they'll go back to the underside of the flower, cut a little hole, and then they'll slurp out the nectar. Now, the bee's okay, but then the, uh, the flower doesn't get that benefit of the pollination. And that's not sustainable because the, the flowers need to be pollinated in order to uh, reproduce. So um, it, while these kind of flowers look really, really cool, and it's okay to have a couple of them around your house, these are not a great resource for honeybees to gather um, their, their pollen and nectar from. This is one of my favorite pictures in this, in this PowerPoint um, because it shows all the different levels of how you can plant for honeybees. First, you want your nice, strong, tall tree um, in the middle. Then you have your thinner trees uh, going up the sides. And then you have your vines tangling everything together. Um, bonus points here. Honeybees actually pollinate poison ivy vines. So it's, that was one of the weird things when we first got into beekeeping that we learned is that in our area um, here in North Dallas, they, they pollinate poison ivy. Um, poison ivy has this tiny little flower that bees can gather uh, pollen and, and nectar from. So um, it's just, it's just one of those things that you don't think that it, that kind of, uh, usually like a parasitic kind of vine like that would need pollination, but honeybees view that as a valuable resource. So if you, if you don't need to clear out an area like this, if you have property, um, then just leave it wild or you can uh, clear it out and then plant bee beneficial things in that area. Um, but this kind of wild look to it is exactly what the honeybees need because underneath those uh, small trees, then you have your bushes and hedges, as well as your wildflowers and ground cover. These uh, red and yellow flowers, and at the bottom they're called Indian paint, uh, sorry, Indian blanket. And they look gorgeous when you have a full field of them. Many cities are doing um, pollinator initiatives where they will plant um, flowers in the, in the city parks and that helps to add back some of that nutrition for the surrounding insects. And that has really been helping the honeybees um, just to give them a place to go back to and, and get some food. The honeybees were here before we were, so uh, it's only fair that we provide a little bit of food for them as we go along. But this is exactly what I love to see um, in parks and just let it go wild, you know, maintain it, make it look nice, but that's, that's what we want to see for the honeybees. So a friend of mine, uh, Becky Bender, she's a master naturalist uh, here in Texas, and I have some information about her at the end, but these pictures came from her, and this is what she did in her garden. So she planted three by three foot squares of each type of plant. That's going to give the bees a lot of um, food and a lot of resources that way they can sustain their colony of about 60 to 80,000 bees in the summertime. That's a lot of mouths to feed. So you want to make sure that you have a lot of flowers in order to cover that. Um, here you can see just the large uh, sections that she's created. Oops, let me go back one. Um, this, again, it just kind of looks like a, a flower waterfall, the way that she arranged this. And I think it just looks amazing. This kind of greenish, uh, blue gray plant in the back, that's called Texas, uh, I think I just forgot. I think it's Texas sage. Um, that is an excellent weather predictor. It, um, basically it is, it is better than any weatherman. It'll bloom this beautiful, bright pinkish purple flower about 24 hours before it's about to rain. 
If you live here in the Dallas area, definitely check it out. You might want to get a, a pot or something just to help you know how to prepare for the day. But um, we have these all around my neighborhood and I absolutely love them. Uh, helps me know when to, when to bring in the lawn furniture. All right, so if you're like me and when you started uh, planting and stuff, um, some people don't like to get their hands in the dirt and um, especially if it's just for like the, uh, just the benefit of just looking at pretty flowers. I like to be very practical in what I do. So if I'm gonna get dirty, I wanna make sure I can use the, the, the plant. So one thing I started was an herb garden. Now, sadly, the one that's pictured is not mine. <laughs> I don't have quite that much space, but um, the same kind of thing. If you can plant in large sections, that's gonna help to sustain the bees. So some easy um, herbs that you can plant for uh, the bees are rosemary, oregano, and basil. There's several different like uh, strands or, or breeds of basil. And one year, my family actually made American, or we planted uh, American Thai and Italian basil. Each of them has a little bit different food flavor. So you can use them in different dishes, expand your horizons with honey, as well as different um, different dishes that you might prepare. Uh, thai is, I think, excellent in Chinese, and of course, Thai food. Um, it has just a little bit different kind of flavor to it. The other thing you can do with basil is, my family has a recipe where we'll basically take about a plant worth, <laughs> very exact measurements, um, I don't know, several cups of, of uh, basil leaves, rinse them off and then put them into your uh, blender. And then you can mix in some like lemon juice and about a head of garlic. And that makes an excellent salad dressing. Um, it just kind of comes out like a basil pesto kind of uh, texture and it, it's excellent. <laughs> so just put it in a, in a quart size jar and it'll, it'll save for a couple weeks. Um, and then you can do lavender. Lavender is very soothing to, uh, to several people. Um, people always buy the lavender extract, lavender ca candles. And for me, if you plant some in your backyard and your dog happens to brush up by it, now your dog smells like lavender. <laughs> so, um, the other thing, my family really likes to do a little bit of Mexican cooking. So we always, always love cilantro or sometimes it's labeled as coriander. Um, but cilantro has um, a very kind of light flavor to it and it's excellent in pico de gallo or um, enchiladas, anything like that. Excellent. And then of course, mint. Uh, that grows like a weed, so make sure you plant it in a pot. That way it doesn't take over your whole area. Um, but that's a, a very good herb for the bees as well. Oh, and with the uh, with the mint, if you put that into your blender again with uh, some blueberries, that can make an excellent protein shake too. Excellent. Um, all right, so then moving on to how to use honey. Um, Honey can be used in several different ways. Most commonly, it's used in cooking because that's how most people use it. Honey it comes in a lot of different uh, tastes and textures. So um, I think I have a slide on that one for the next one, but I'll, I'll double check on that one. But when honey comes in, um, when it comes to honey, you can see the, the picture that we have on the uh, slide here. This is exactly the way that the bees made it. This is what we call comb honey. Um, you can eat it straight out of the hive, just like this. Um, sometimes I'll take my hive tool and just grab out a chunk and eat it. Um, and it doesn't need to be processed or anything. Honeybees are extremely hygienic. They keep their hive uh, very, very clean because they're birthing babies in there and they need to make sure that it's completely disease free. So the honey, um, is antibacterial, antiviral, and um, and and, and, and anti-inflammatory as well. So it can be used for a lot of different things. You can eat it straight from the comb like this. That's called, called comb honey. Um, there's uh, regular liquid honey, 
where we just take a hot knife, remove that wax capping on top of the uh, frame there, and then uh, we'll put it into a centrifuge, which basically uh, is basically a basin that will uh, rotate at a high rate of speed, and then that's going to help sling all that honey out, and then it'll drain down to the bottom of the tank. Um, after we run it through a couple di different uh, strainers just to get the large chunks of wax or <laughs> the unfortunate bee that might have been still in there, um, then we will uh, just run it through those couple of strainers and then you can just bottle it straight like that. So when you're buying honey, you can know that it is uh, minimally processed because it doesn't need to be processed and uh, you can just eat it straight like that. Another texture of honey that you can buy is called creamed honey. Have you ever heard of creamed honey before? So creamed honey has a very smooth peanut butter kind of texture. And the way that it's made is you take a bucket of regular liquid honey, you make sure it doesn't have any crystals in it, and then you feed that bucket a very, very tiny, smooth crystal, and then it will, um, the way crystals do it is that they would just replicate um, what's around them. So when you feed it that tiny little starter seed of crystal, then it will replicate that seed. And then um, after a little bit, then that entire bucket will be um, converted to those crystals of honey. And from there, then it can basically be used kind of like a peanut butter because it's just got this very thick, texture to it to where when you put it on your bread, it doesn't slide off as quick. So it's great instead of like a PB&J, um, you can use it as a fruit dip too, because it's nice and thick you can scoop it in there. Um, or if you're like me and just wanna just taste the different flavors of honey, you just take a scoop, put it in your mouth and just let it melt. It's excellent. So there's about 300 different varieties of honey here in the US. So in order to find all the different ones, you can go to the honey locator map uh, found on honey.com. And uh, there you can zoom into where you are or where you're interested in, in getting honey from. You'll find several different producers there and um, that's gonna help you to um, just taste the different varieties of honey. Honey can range from very, very light to a very dark honey. The light honey, um, like fireweed honey, comes from Alaska. It has a very light kind of powder sugar kind of flavor to it. And then the buckwheat honey has a very dark, bold flavor to it. And that um, has a little bit kind of deeper molasses -y kind of flavor to it. So each flavor, each type of honey can be used for a, a different purpose, especially in cooking, then you can, um, in cooking, uh, in cooking, you're going to kind of figure out what kind of recipe you're using. Uh, for instance, if you're making like a peanut butter MG bite where it has very strong, bold flavors, you want a honey that can um, kind of stand up to the challenge and complement those um, complement those flavors. And then you also want to make sure that um, that you're using honey. Like if there's any honey cr crystallized in your pantry or something, um, that it hasn't gone bad. Honey, when it gets cold, especially now when the weather's starting to get cold, uh, you might find that your jar of honey will crystallize. And if some people like that, it's kind of like rock candy. My sister absolutely loves it. We always put that in a special jar for her. Um, that way she can just chow down when she's home. And then, um, you can you can use that just like you would with anything else. But if you want to come to um, change or reliquify your crystallized honey, um, if you buy your honey in a glass jar, then you can just um, bring a pot of water up to a, a low simmer, and then turn off the water, put your glass jar of honey inside that uh, water bath, and then it will slowly warm up that honey without uh, destroying the beneficial enzymes and the uh, different things in the honey. Um, you might need to re repeat that depending on how large your container is. Um, but that's why I always recommend to buy in glass 
And so that way, if you don't use it quickly, you can do that reliquifying process. If you buy it with plastic, your jar might melt. So sorry. Um, but the best thing you can do if you do have a plastic jar is just try to scrape out as much as you can, put it in like a ceramic dish or, or a bowl or something and put that inside. It's the same process with a do double boiler. So you can also use honey for uh, skin care and hair care to add moisture back into those areas and add a little bit more shine to your, your hair. All right, so lastly, um, you can also connect with your bee clubs and they're going to give you great, valuable, up-to-date information about your area. Beekeeping varies quite a bit from east to west, north and south, and um, it, it's helpful if you're wanting to get into beekeeping to know what you can do in this area. Um, a lot of the information that you find online is, of course, throughout the world. And um, if you thought beekeeping within the U.S. varied, throughout the world even different. Um, so just if you're interested in starting a beehive, just get involved with the local bee clubs because they're going to tell you what kind of um, what kind of struggles that you have here. Um, because up north they have to deal with more cold or snow, um, but down here where we usually have fairly gentle winters. Um, that is going to help us, uh, or, or that's going to encourage us to make sure that these have enough resources because the flowers usually don't bloom in December kind of time frame, December, January. Uh, so sometimes we have to do supplemental feedings just to get our bees through since they're still kind of active. So bee clubs are a great resource for the community if you're interested in doing any um, like Girl Scout or Boy Scout kind of projects, community involvement projects. Um, just contact your local beekeepers, and you can do that through the Texas Beekeepers website. Um, and you can, uh, they have another map where you can scroll in and see the local bee clubs near you. And then um, the other program to look out for would be the Real Texas Honey Program. That, again, is going to show you local beekeepers here in Texas, uh, throughout Dallas, and even down to Houston and Austin. Um, so you can, again, just scroll in, find the closest beekeeper to you, and then you can help support the local beekeepers. And that way your money is going back into the community. So one of the last ways that you can help us out is by supporting the American Honey Queen program. And while I mentioned it earlier, let me go ahead and, and show you a little bit more about that. So each year, two representatives are selected for the, uh, to represent the American Beekeeping Federation. And what we do is we travel the entire country, um, and especially now with, with COVID, we're doing virtually and in person. So um, if you know of anybody that would like to learn about, uh, learn more about bees or, or beekeeping or uh, how to use honey, anything like that, you can contact us and we can, we can schedule a presentation with them. Um, so our job is um, our, our role is funded through the donations of those concerned with the plight of the honeybee and basically just the people that are interested in um, in supporting honeybees and our food supply really. If we were to lose our honeybees, we'd lose one third of the food that we eat. And while most people think of the produce um, and berries, you also need to think about what those products go into. Dried berries are very common in trail mixes and cereals, um, as well as honeybees pollinate the alfalfa, which then dairy cows eat. So through their pollination efforts, honeybees can also reach into the, um, the dairy industry as well. So all of those products would be um, minimal as well. Honeybees are absolutely vital, 100% vital for the pollination of almonds in California. And currently, California is the number one world producer of almonds. Um, again, almonds go into different things, like trail mix, but they also get turned into um, almond milk, which uh, many people eat as a milk substitute. So then, um, just showing people how honeybees are, are invested into our community can help people um, want to return the favor to the bees 
And that's, that's basically our job, is pointing out how honeybees affect each single person. So all the, program, all the funds go directly towards the expenses of the program. I don't make a dime off of this program. This is all volunteer for me. And then um, it just helps us to, to produce educational materials, um, like this honey queen brochure. I posted the link for that in the chat, or is it the chat or the Q&A, but one of those. Um, so go ahead and check out that link. There's a PDF of this. It has um, some great recipes throughout the countries, um, or really throughout the world. So we have it kind of arranged um, by which country produced which, um, which recipe. But my favorite is actually this honey butter skillet corn. It's only got like five recipes and two of those, uh, sorry, five ingredients. And there's only like two of those that are like salt and pepper. So it's super easy and it's easier uh, to whip up than mac and cheese. So <laughs> be sure to uh, try that out if you have any little kiddos. Um, we also, since we travel with um, airfare and uh, cars, uh, all that kind of expenses go to, all the funds go to those kind of expenses as well. Um, so, all of that allows us to reach uh, about 7.5 million people each year, um, whether that be through colleges, uh, school visits, or even media interviews. On average, we garner about $500,000 of media publicity every single year. And um, we don't pay for any of that. It's usually if we're at like a fair. Um, or if we're in town and somebody wants to write an article about us, they can contact us and um, we can give them some great information about the beekeeping industry. And then we also travel for about 340 days of the year. Anybody want to guess how many days are in one year? <laughs> about 365, right? Well, and a quarter if you want to throw that in there. But anyway, um, we travel for the majority of the year, and even with COVID, that hasn't really slowed down because while the in-person presentations have slowed down, uh, we're still keeping up with that track record um, by doing these kind of virtual presentations, um, as well as many schools are wanting recorded presentations. So we'll make some of those and send those on um, onto the schools. So um, there's a there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in order to get ready for these kind of events and. All of that is, is what we're willing to do in order to help people learn about honeybees. So different ways that you can help us is one, to invite, your, uh, invite us to your event like you did today. And then you can also like us on our uh, Facebook page, but also subscribe to our YouTube channel, the American Honey Queen Program. And uh, on there, you can find some great videos about what happens when honeybee stings um, or possibly how to reliquify your honey. The process I described earlier with the double boiler system, we have a video of that on our channel. So you can reference that if you ever need to reliquify your honey. And then lastly, you can become a financial partner with us um, through a couple different ways. But one of the main ways that we do while we're on the road is by doing this quilt raffle. And each year this handmade quilt is made, uh, especially each year. This is a square of this year's um, of this year's quilt. <clears throat> uh, the winning ticket will be pulled at the uh, ABF convention or American Beekeeping Federation convention in January. Uh, this year is held in Las Vegas, so um, the last night that's when the tickets can be pulled. Uh, the winner does not have to be present to win, as we collect your name phone number and your mailing address so we can send that quilt directly to you. So if you're interested in uh, purchasing any tickets, they're only $5 each or you can get four for 20 and um, you can become a proud owner of a handmade, what size quilt? Queen size, of course. You know, we have these, we have these puns in the beef world. Um, but yes, it's a queen size quilt and it's just absolutely beautiful every single year. So if you're interested in, in supporting us through this program or through this uh, quilt raffle, you can email, I'm uh, sorry, you can mail your, um, your check or cash along with a, a slip of paper um, talking about like what event you met me at. You just say Dallas College 
and then um, then you put down your your um, name, phone number, and mailing address, and we can get those uh, raffle tickets to you. So um, there we go. So here's a couple different links uh, for you guys to check out our Facebook program, our Facebook page. Uh, where we post about the, the work that we're doing, as well as fun information about honeybees. We also have a Buzzing Across America uh, website, which is um, mainly geared towards the younger audience, but it can be helpful to help link the older with the younger generation. And uh, it pro provides some great um, information that's kid friendly. Uh, kids can read it, navigate the website very easily as well as we have some recipes on there that they can try out as well. Uh, Becky Bender's website is budsandthebees.com. That has some great planting guides for this area of Dallas, um, as well as you can contact her with, with any questions about uh, specific plants and uh, scientific names of the plants. That's not my specialty, but um, that's, she's a great resource for you as well. So at this time, um, I'll turn it back over to Faye to see if we have any questions. Thank you so much, Virginia. That was wonderful and extremely informative. And I have to say, I just, I love bee puns. So thank you so much for, I was hoping you were going to add a lot of those in there. Um, and we do actually have a few questions and we should be able to get through all of them. Um, before I go to the first one though, Nakia in the chat mentioned, um, one of his favorite movies is B Movie. Do you like that movie too? I have to ask for him. They have a lot of good points in there. Uh, I think they they did a great job at pointing people and showing people the impact the honeybees have. Um, I think factually they kind of messed up on a couple of different things, but I like the the idea that they were trying to uh, garner attention for the honey industry. Um, a lot of people will get into beekeeping thinking it's very easy. But again, if you go back to the bee club, that's going to help you know what you're getting into before you actually invest your time, money, and effort into, um, into starting bees. So if you're interested in starting bees, check out your uh, local beekeepers. But uh, yes, I thought the, the bee, bee movie was, was very humorous. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so the first question is, Lori would like to know, um, were your honeybees affected by the snowmageddon we had um, last year in February, and how did you protect them? You know, the funny thing about snowmageddon was that um, we found quite varied results. We know some beekeepers that weren't touched at all. We know other beekeepers that lost every single hive. And then we had some in the middle that were, you know, they lost a, a couple. Um, uh, my personal, my family, I don't know why, but I just the RBs, um, they weren't really affected that much. Um, we lost a couple hives, but honestly, we have about 20. So it's it's normal to lose about 40% of our hives every single year with or without snowmageddon. Um, so it's, it's difficult kind of industry like that because we do lose quite a few of our hives every single year, um, despite our efforts. I mean, that's nature, that's farming, um, but there's not much we can do to prevent that. As far as preparing your hives for that kind of cold winter, um, some beekeepers put um, like a solid board underneath the hive, that way it prevents an updraft. Usually we use screened bottom boards here in Texas because it's so hot, we just need to give the bees some extra ventilation. So if we know ahead of time that that kind of storm's coming, or that we're gonna get some cold north winds, then we can put that kind of board underneath and that can help to uh, keep that hive warm. Um, once you get farther up north into like Wisconsin, um, they will like wrap the hives, but that is not something that we do down here because our weather can change very quickly. And if we are not able to tend to our bees, cause sometimes they're in a different location than where we live. Um, if we can't get out there fast enough and remove that, um, that wrapping, then that can actually overheat the bees. So it, it's kind of different, but um, what we mainly did was, was we weren't able to get out there fast enough. So uh, we kind of just let them do their thing and most of them survived. Thank you for that. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump down to Andrea's question. Is honey effective for scars and acne? Some people have found benefits with it. Um, it's Again, that's a medical kind of question, and each person reacts a little bit differently to it. Um, if you're interested, always double check with your doctor. Um, but, I mean, yeah, you can just check with your doctor. Um, I know several people in the homeopathic communities that have found benefit. But, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on, on you and how you react to different uh, organic materials like that. And I guess along those same lines, Ashley was asking, is it true you can overcome allergy issues with local raw honey? Right, same kind of thing. Um, some people have found benefit, um, other people haven't. So always just check your doctor with those kind of medical questions. And I was wondering, um, is there legislation to protect native bees? I'm not sure, like off the top of my head, um, part of that's because I've been traveling quite a bit and I have to uh, be up to date on each different state, but um, you can, I know that the Texas Beekeepers Association does uh, lobby for different bee friendly laws. I don't know about specifically native bees. I know that um, the native bee populations were kind of dwindling um, and that's why the honeybees uh, were even brought into this country was just so that they could help keep pollinating our food in order to um, just provide us with enough food. Um, so there's a couple different things. I know there's native bee houses, but a lot of my kind of work um, focuses on how the community can help the honeybees by planting, using honey, that kind of thing, where their money can go back into the community and help those local bees. Awesome, thank you. And um, Lori commented that it was very cool that honey has the tones of the flowers that the pollen is collected from. Um, can you just like run through that just really quickly again? Yeah, so the, the flavor comes from the different nectar of the flowers. Um, the pollen, while there might be some pollen in the honey, uh, generally they are kept separate inside the hive. Uh, when you're looking at a frame of honey, you can actually see kind of like this rainbow look uh, shape to the frame where the bottom part is going to be the brood that um, kind of has a little bit more rough kind of look to it. And then uh, that's the, where the baby bees are. And then there's a thin band of pollen. It's very colorful, generally yellows, reds. Uh, you saw them, you might see is a little bit of green. And then up in the corners of your, uh, of your hive, that's where the honey is going to be. Now, if you put another box on top of that, they're going to continue that pattern, and then that next box is going to be honey. And it's just very interesting to see how the bees are so organized and how everybody working together uh, can produce so much honey. Um, in this area, it's pretty average to get about 40 to 50 pounds of honey each year. Um, but again, it's farming, so it's, it's not super predictable. So sometimes it's less, sometimes it's a little more. So. Yeah, that's amazing. And Lori says that's amazing um, in the chat. And um, uh, so um, Monica commented that she had to leave early, but she said your presentation was awesome and very informative. Um, it looks like we've gotten through all of the questions. If anyone else has a question, please put it in the chat. Um, we're running a, a little out of time. Virginia, while we're waiting for any last minute questions, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything else we can do as individuals to you know, help the bee population survive? Yeah, so uh, I wanna leave you with just one last thought. So uh, just remember that the floral varieties are the spice of life to honeybees. So the different flowers and the different flavors of those nectars, those, um, it's not just, it's just not, it's not just taste. It's also nutritional content as well. So um, I want you to close your eyes for a minute and think about the most, uh, your, your most favorite food. It could be ice cream, it could be apples, it could be veggies, anything like that. You have it locked in your mind? Okay, now I want you to think about the taste, the texture, and the flavor, 
and then think about eating that for an entire month. Do you think it tastes very good? Probably not. And it kind of lost some of its specialty flavor in there, right? So um, just like you want different varieties of food, uh, you want your meats, you don't want just beef, you want your uh, beef, pork, chicken, and, and turkey, especially this time of year. Um, and you want those varieties in order to help you stay nice and healthy, as well as keep some interest in eating as well. Um, so keep that in mind when you're planting for your bees is um, just plant a variety of flowers. Wildflower seed mixes are excellent for that uh, because they just provide a, just this Walmart size um, a resource that the bees can keep going back to year round. Thank you. Oh, and uh, we've got we've got two more um, comments that came up. So, do bees really communicate by dancing? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> so they communicate through different uh, different ways. One of them is through um, pheromones or perfumes. Um, another way is through dancing. Um, if you will, if you just take your hand like this and you kind of just wiggle it down, and then you kind of go up and around like a figure eight, shake it down in the middle, and then you go up and around to the other side. So what that's doing is that's what we call a waggle dance. So the distance down that she travels tells the bees how far away the field of flowers is. The angle at which she does it on the comb tells them the angle relative to the sun's position, as well as the intensity of the, of the, uh, of the dance will also um, tell them how good of a resource. Some worker bees might even bring back some samples them to taste and be like, guys, this is really, really good. You've got to come help me uh, gather these, this nectar. And uh, that's how honeybees help communicate through through waggle dance. Waggle, I love that word. <laughs> okay. Um, and then um, Andrea has another um, question. Um, she says, "Thank you, Miss Virginia. I've been told that if." Uh, one, if a person is too healthy or is healthy, too much honey can be harmful to a healthy person's health. Um, so I'll just like um, say what you said again, that, you know, you should always consult your doctor. But I guess in your experience, have you ever seen that um, honey being harmful to a person's health? Honey is safe for, for adults to eat and really children over the age of one year. Um, under a year old, the... Um, the baby's immune system is not uh, fully mature to, to digest this type of agriculture product. So um, you wanna make sure that you don't feed it to kids under a year old, but anyone over that, it should be safe. Um, of course, if you're a diabetic, it honey is a sugar. So always check with your doctor for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Virginia. This was so informative. Um, I just, I was personally just a bee novice. I know nothing other than actually what was in bee movie. So thank you for commenting on that as well. I feel like I know so much more now and I hope our, um, I hope our audience does too. Um, so um, we'll, we'll go ahead and end the session now. Thank you to everyone on behalf of Dallas College and the Sustainability Department for coming. Thank you, Virginia, for um, participating and congratulations on your title and just great job on everything you're doing. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>